Hello, everybody. Um, yeah. So. So yeah. So um, this talk is not going to be about um, performance. Um, um, that was the first. Uh, I think I wanted to say. So, yeah. So we did the talk. Um, so we, um, we were, there are two of us basically. So here you have uh, Claudio. Uh, I don't know if uh, you guys know him. Um, and so we shared uh, the load basically. So everything that is small, fast, his he did it, and <laughs> everything else that is bloated doesn't work yet, etc. I'm the one to blame. So, um, yeah, we're going to talk today about um, ABI analysis and um, ABI analysis in general and how um, we're applying it to, uh, to the Linux kernel. Um, so after a quick introduction, I'm going to talk about um, the tools that are um, using the Libabigel framework that we use for this um, ABI static analysis. And, um, and I'm also going to, to present the different types of, of debug information or type information that we're using as, as, as an input today and, and, and show how they differ in terms of performance. And so yeah, there's still performance talk. Um, and um, yeah. Whenever you see the need of you know, asking questions and so on and so forth, please uh, go ahead. But in any case, we'll try to have some, uh, some, you know, some time at the end uh, for questions. OK, so um, initially, uh, Libabigail intended um, to, was intended to represent um, artifacts of application binary interfaces. Um, it was mostly for shared uh, libraries, uh, system libraries. Um, namely, you know, we were working at the time on uh, on the new version of uh, the lib uh, C++. Uh, it was uh, lib, you know, circa I don't know, two, 2010 ish uh, for um, um, C++ 11. So we wanted to know, you know, what we were changing, and in terms of ABI interfaces, and whether those changes were, you know, um, breaking or compatible or not. So that's where uh, this whole thing started. And so the idea was to, to look at, to be able to analyze things impacting not only symbols, because this, is, this was what people were doing at the time, like using NM, for instance, uh, look at the, you know, symbols and diff them or whatever. Uh, but we also wanted to, to, to you know, to analyze changes to declarations, namely functions and global variables that were exported by the binaries. Um, and also, and more importantly, their types, you know. Um, so if something changed in the types, we would, we wanted to be able to, to, to detect it and, and analyze it. Of course, uh, comparing those, those different kind of artifacts was, something that was very key uh, to us at the time uh, because we wanted not just to display, you know, uh, um, what changed, but we also wanted to, to, to apply some reasoning on what changed. So is that change okay? Is that change compatible with what we had before, et cetera, et cetera. And that meant, uh, being able to emit meaningful report. What does that mean? Uh, things we were going to talk about shouldn't be, I don't know, addresses and things like that. It should be, it, it should be meaningful to the programmer or to the person you know, reading the report. You should talk about types. You, know, you messed up your struct there at line 22, for instance, and the name of the data member changed from foo to bar, you know, these kind of things. And of course, uh, it should operate on binaries directly, not you know, necessarily source code. Because if you, when you deal with C, you are subject to the tyranny of the, micro, of the preprocessor. So things you, you see in the source code might not still be there 
you know, at the binary level or vice versa. So being able to, you know, to, to work on the binary directly was uh, paramount. And so obviously we started out using Dwarf um, as the input for all the artifact we would be, you know, um, handling. Why? Well, before, because um, it was uh, present everywhere. GCC would emit Dwarf for everything. I mean, everything. Programs in all languages. We started with C++, but uh, very quickly, uh, the Glibc the guys wanted to be able to apply this uh, kind of analysis as well. Uh, folks uh, in the, I don't know, uh, the GCC community. And I don't know, GCC, for instance, uh, emits libraries in Ada, in Fortran, and so uh, we needed to, you know, be able to support all that uh, array, range of, of languages, and so on and so forth. So Dwarf was, you know, a no-brainer. And uh, in the in the the ecosystem where we were, like uh, I started working on the Fedora binaries and so on and so forth. At the time. Uh, it was GCC uh, mainly that was used, and its dwarf generation was, you know, quite uh, on par. So uh, we started having, uh, you know, some some tools very early on, based on the library. Uh, one of the first tools uh, is ABI diff, as its name uh, suggests. It you know compares to binaries. Um, compares the, the declarations that are, you know, defined and exported by these binaries and which sh show the differences um, in terms of ABI. If the binaries are, um, have debug info with them, uh, what is shown is obviously more detailed. Otherwise, it's only about, you know, uh, um, L, you know, elf symbols and, and whatnot, which is not very useful to me, but Anyway, we still can work without debug info. And then and there was a second tool. Um, uh, Rudy, can you put it uh, full screen, maybe? Because the font is... Ah, it is already full screen, but yeah. Oh, oh then... Yeah, sorry, so... Yeah, anyway, um, I'll try to describe, so if you just... So the second tool is ABI package diff, which does pretty much the same thing as ABI diff, but it works on packages. So RPMs, Debian uh, deb files, tarballs, and uh, yeah, it would uh, compare the binaries embedded into in, in, inside those uh, those those um, those packages. Um, another tool that was uh, that was uh, intended to be not intended to be used by others is ABIDW. So ABIDW takes a, a binary and serializes um, that ba the ABI of that binary onto the disk, you know? So it emits a textual representation of that, uh, of that ABI. So it was meant for me for debugging, uh, de debugging purposes. Um, but then, you know, people started to, you know, wanted to, 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 to use it to store ABI, in, you know, artifacts in, in Git or whatever. People are crazy. <laughs> and then <laughs> there is ABI Compact. What it does is it takes um, an application and it says if that application is compatible with a shared library, kind of. Um, and uh, yeah, it's quite interesting. And uh, well, there is KMI diff as well, KMI diff. As the name doesn't suggest, um, takes it, it, it compares the the KBI, so the kernel module interface. <laughs> uh, at the time, nobody. I mean, it was not great to to talk about KBI because it is something that doesn't exist. Apparently, uh, the kernel doesn't have any ABI, so I decided to call that uh, kernel module interface. So it takes two kernel trees basically and compares them to and 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 tries to to say if uh, the type changes are compatible um, in terms of the modules that the, the, the kernel is going to load. Um, and then there is ABI lint, uh, which is still intended for just for debugging purposes for us um, to 
the idea is to say if an ABI XML, so ABI XML is the thing that is uh, stored by ABI diff, basically a textual representation of <laughs> an ABI file. Say if that ABI XML is well formed, can be loaded, blah, blah, blah. And then there are some external tools uh, that use um, some of these tools. Uh, I've just mentioned the tools that I've been involved with um, during their, their development. So there is one which is called um, RPM Inspect. It is used in Fedora today and also in the RHEL um, ecosystem. Um, basically, it is uh, run by the build system, the build system of RPMs. And so when a new RPM is, a new version of a, I don't know, the GLIPC comes out, um, RPM inspect is run and has a tons of, of tests, you know, like testing for, I don't know, uh, doing all sorts of static analysis, blah, 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 licensing checks, blah, 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 and ABI analysis as well. So it can test if, um, you know, how compatible uh, the, that new RPM you're issuing is with the uh, previous uh, stable one, and so on and so forth. And there is uh, the check UAPI.sh uh, script that was uh, integrated in a recent uh, kernel, um, Linux kernel. And as the name suggests, it uh, tests the compatibility of uh, the UAPI, uh, which is kind of interesting the way it does it. Um, because, you know, um, the UAPI is a set of header files, basically. So what it does is, it, well, it compiles those uh, header files by, you know, including them in a C file, and, uh, and, and, and then it has a binary, and then it uses um, ABI diff to, to uh, compare it and see if it is still compatible. So, yeah, these are the... This is the ecosystem we have today based on LibAbigail to perform um, um, ABI analysis. But what exactly is, what exactly are we doing, you know, under the hood? This ecosystem of tools use the same library, which is, sorry, written in C++. Um, and it is written around a central IR, you know, and that IR uh, has been, you know, uh, custom tailored um, um, to to handle this um, this uh, this ABI thing. So basically, we represent the ABI as something we call a corpus, an ABI corpus. I don't know. If, yeah. um, and and this is central to the IR. From a corpus, you can get uh, the set of variables you know, that are exported by that um, ABI corpus and the set of functions. So, and from that set of uh, variables and functions, which are declarations, we can get more information. So I'm just giving you an idea of how the IR looks like so that you, you can see for yourself the, the kind of detailed um, analysis we can, we, can, we can perform. So basically, Declarations are, are um, ABI artifacts, you know? Um, and from a declaration, we can get its name, its location, its scope. So we do, you know, scope analysis uh, potentially as well. So we're not just talking about, you know, ELF symbols and things like that. Um, and then the decal, the decal base uh, type, which is, which is, uh, how we represent all the decals, all the declarations, um, can be further specified into either variables or functions. So a variable typically has a, a type, uh, an elf symbol, okay? And a function has a type which is more specific. It's a function type, which is, you know, uh, very specific and, and has um, also its symbols. And so, of course, then we are dealing with types. You know, uh, so a type is also an, an ABI artifact. So, you know, it extends the type of decal base, which is the type of ABI artifact. And uh, from there, we can get its size, its alignment, and so, and so on and so forth. And so, for instance, I don't know, uh, a type like I don't, a char or an integer is going to be a special kind of, of type that we call the type decal. Um, and it 
it is a type, so we can get its size, alignment, and so on and so forth. But it is also a declaration because it is declared by the compiler. Okay, um, and so we can get its name, its location. In this case, it's going to be an, an artificial location, something like that. Its scope, blah blah blah, and. You also have types that can be defined by the user, like an enum type, right? Which is a type, so it extends the type base, okay? So we can get its size, its alignment from there, but it is also a declaration, you know? Uh, so we can get its name, its location, scope, et cetera, et cetera. And unlike those two types, there is there are function types that are special. We can get their, the parameters from there, the return types, whether they're variadic or you know, all kind of stuff. But it's just a type. It doesn't have a declaration because in C, C++, blah, 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 you, you don't declare a function type directly. You, know? you declare a function and we infer the type from it. Or you declare a, a pointer to a, a function type and we infer the type from there too. So we try to have an IR here that is very tailored to what we're doing, unlike reusing, for instance, the IR of LLVM or so. Sorry, you, you had a question? Oh, oh sorry. Uh, no problem. Um, so, but then we also want to compare stuff. We're in the business of comparing types and, and so on and so forth. So we represent also what we call diffs, okay? So a diff is an operation between two ABI artifacts. So it has a first subject and a second subject the things we're diffing, okay? And we can, from a diff, uh, we can, we can uh, say or, uh, or, or, or see if the diff carries some changes, okay? And if it does, then we can, uh, you know, report it. Um, but then there are special kinds of, 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 of diffs. You can have diffs of types, diffs of declarations, et cetera, et cetera. And so, for instance, an enum diff, which is a diff between two enum types that we've seen previously, is going to be a diff between two types. Uh, and so, that from that uh, enum diff, we can get the first uh, subject of, of the diff, which is the first enum. We can get the second enum, et cetera, et cetera. So, a report <coughs> is going to be a pass, basically, that will walk the graph of diff nodes, basically, you know, and, 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 and performing some, some operations. It can perform some transformations, and so on and so forth. So typical compiler stuff. And then we also have a corpus diff, which can diff to, you know, uh, corpora, is the plural of corpus in Latin. So, um, and so we can get the first corpus, second cor corpus, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but it's not a diff, um, well, it's a, it's a separate kind of diff, basically. So here we kind of have seen what, we, uh, what I would call the middle end, you know, of, of, the, of the framework of, you know. Um, but then from where do we build this information from? So we build it from front-end interfaces uh, that we have, so things are backward. Here, you know, the uh, reading the binaries, you know, is the done by front end, <laughs> and the back end emits reports or things like that. So we have a front end interface that knows how to read uh, a corpus, um, which is abstract, and that front end interface is implemented by concrete front end interface, um, front, concrete fr front end implementations. So, like a, a dwarf reader, um, we have a BTF reader. Um, and we have a CTF reader today that all implement that same interface. And so if, actually we also have an ABI XML reader that I forgot to, I just, yeah, yeah. so no, I, did, I, I just added it. So anyway, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's just to, I'm trying to, you know, to be uh, cool here. Uh, <laughs> in case he didn't show. Um, <clears throat> So yeah, we have a number of, of, of concrete, um, concrete um, front ends here. And so, for instance, the dwarf, interfa uh, the, the, the dwarf front end um, will not leak anything, um, okay, in theory, <laughs> too specific to dwarf, 
you know, we use the Health Util um, library, you know, with it, which has its own IR, and so we use that IR at that level, and it doesn't leak. Okay. Um, the same for the BTF uh, reader. The CTF reader uses the, the libctf, um, you know, uh, infrastructure, and it doesn't, you know, it stays there, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, if someone has a new, a new kind of debug information, he would like to support. Be my guest. So let's look at what we have uh, historically in the front, <laughs> in the Dwarf front end. As you all know, uh, Dwarf um, comes with a lot, a lot of details. You know, it supports uh, virtually all the languages that are compiled um, today. Um, <coughs> you know, a few weeks ago, someone filed a bug to Libabigail, and it was like, you know. Uh, looping endlessly on a, on a binary that I didn't know about, whatever. Uh, it was in Rawhide, Fedora Rawhide. And looking at it, it actually was uh, one of the libraries of the Modu Modula 2 uh, language, which is a fancy new, uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> new front end implementation of GCC, <laughs> uh, which was uh, in, uh, yeah, in, in Rawhide, and I didn't know about it. So, yeah, I went to add support for that. So, in the next version of Libabigal, we're supporting Modula 2. So, yeah, very important. So, it's just to give you, you know, an idea of the, the you know, the breadth of, of Dwarf. And one thing that Dwarf does, um, which is especially tailored to, um, you know, debuggers that we know like GDB and, and so on and so forth, is that for every single translation unit that are represented in Dwarf, all the declarations, all the types, everything is represented in that translation unit. So if you have 1,000 translation units in a binary, you will have 1,000 representation of all the types. And then suppose now, I don't know, so that's a, a very abstract thought experiment. I don't know if it matches uh, reality. Imagine you have header files in which you defined some types, thought experiments, like, I don't know, uh, vector, uh, you know, C++ vector um, inline, um, in include file. And then you include that file in those uh, 1,000 uh, translation units. So you'll have those types you know, duplicated uh, 1,000 time uh, minus, minus one or something. Uh, so, yeah, so that's a lot of type that are the same, basically. So that's, for a debugger, there is, it, it's not a problem because you're debugging, you know, one file at a time, right? Uh, but in our case where we're seeing everything at once, it can be, you know, a challenge. So, what we want, if you want to be able to say that this type, you know, in this binary, which is named foo, is present in this second binary as foo, but are they the same thing? Yes or no? So if you want to do that, first you need to get your room clean in the first uh, binary, to, because in the first binary you have 1,000 foos, you know? In theory, there is that thing called the ODR, the one definition rule that was present in the, you know, C++, uh, uh, pre-C++ 11, and is, it is actually present in C11, too, uh, that rule. So, which means that if you have foo in a, in a translation unit, a type, an entity named foo in a translation unit, and an entity named foo in a, another translation unit of the same binary, the, same, the two foos should designate this, the same thing. One definition rule. But it is also said that if that rule is violated, then the tools doesn't, don't have to report it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it is not reported. And so we have violations of that rule all over the place in binaries. So, in other words, when I see two foos, I have to go check if they're the same. This is what we call deduplication. And if they're the same, we just drop all the duplicates and we keep that one. Does that make sense? So, 
And so this deduplication is basically uh, something that takes a lot of time and a lot of space, basically. And so, for instance, if you're just using ABI DW, where you take one binary and you want to dump its ABI on the on the on the floor, uh, you you do the deduplication for one binary. Okay, you have ABI diff. You're comparing two binaries. You deduplicate across two binaries. Does that make sense? And then you're analyzing the Linux kernel. So you have one VM Linux plus 3,000 uh, modules. Then you have to do the, perform the deduplication across thousands of binaries, uh, each with tens of thousands of types that are all struct and pointed to functions. Yeah. So it can take time. <laughs> so basically, this is what makes handling dwarf a bit, uh, you know, slow and big for our uh, for our use case, okay? In general, in general. I say in general because if you are, if you are uh, building an RPM, for instance, um, we still have 25 minutes, so. If, if you're building on RPM today, by default, you have something called DWZ, which is a tool that comes and, um, and analyzes the the, bind, the dwarf, okay, finds duplicates and tries to perform the deduplication. So it, it, it compresses the dwarf that way. And so if you're comparing uh, RPMs using ABI package diff, then you're, you're dealing with an, an, a dwarf, a form of dwarf that is kind of deduplicated. But if you're not, then you're not. Okay, so that's why I'm saying in general. Um, yeah, there is a question here. I'd just like to emphasize the kind of in there. In my experience, even with re really huge things that contain massive amounts of duplication, like Qt6, for example, frequently it just throws its hands up in the air and says, I can't find any, and uh, it would not shrink at all. You know there must be lots of deduplication in things with hundreds of thousands of source files, but sometimes it just doesn't yeah. see any. I don't so, know why. Exactly. And so uh, the, this comment is very important. To, today, uh, so DWZ, you know, does a kind of a, a good job in, in, in you know, compressing the, the dwarf uh, because it factorizes um, those types across not just one um, you know, or two binaries, but across, like for instance, you, you take GCC, the GCC package, okay? So the GCC package will, 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 is a big package, and in that package you have GCC for C++, GCC for Fortran, GCC for et cetera, et cetera. And so, DWZ is going to, to, to factorize uh, the dwarf across all those different GCC packages and come up with a GCC-debug-common uh, RPM that contains the factorized form for all those packages. So the problem is it can take a lot of time and space during the uh, building of the, the package. And so if, when DWZ sees that it is using too much memory in the build system or taking too much time, gives up, <laughs> and so it stops doing, so it, 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 it performs the deduplication to a certain point, and then it gives up, okay? And so, hence uh, what you're saying, that it's not perfect. And so, people uh, came up with alternatives, you know? And so, luckily, so for instance, we have, uh, so after Dwarf, I just order s stuff you know, uh, alphabetically, you know, so just to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, and I did put dwarf first because of, you know, historical reasons. So, anyway, uh, so BTF today, the cool thing, okay, so uh, BTF is available, obviously, for the Linux kernel only. Um, it handles just C and, and, and BPF, but for the Linux kernel, it's not a problem. I mean, uh, well, unless we start dealing with Rust, but <clears throat> anyway. Uh, but for now, it's okay. And then, but then, yeah, it has much 
I mean, it's narrower, okay? And the cool thing is that types are deduplicated already. So, yeah, it doesn't have line information, blah, 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 but then things are fast and small. And so, this is kind of a, um, you know, like, okay, I would say DWZ does uh, uh, done completely, or I didn't want to say done well, but done completely. Uh, so this is pretty cool. So we just have to, to, to use that front end, for, for, for instance, for the kernel, and then things are pretty fast, you know, uh, kind of magically. And then there is CTF as well, which is, uh, you know, available for C. It is emitted by GCC. So actually when I was, uh, uh, looking at you know the the, the the work done on the the, the CTF front end and when we were working on it etc cetera, etc cetera. the cool thing is the test suite yeah because we have tests okay um, for CTF well we were just emitting things you know using GCC actually for the BTF I did the same too because uh, GCC emits BTF so that's pretty cool to be able to handle you know uh, testing that way. And things are deduplicated too. And it is even uh, faster than BTF for several reasons. One thing that I found quite cool is that it has this concept of, um, of uh, you know, kind of archive or library of types that is not independent, but quite from the binaries. Uh, what I mean is you don't have to read all the binaries. Just, you can go and just read one archive of the types, boom, and you, you can do your, your analysis rather than reading 3,000 you know, uh, binaries if you want. So, so even though Dwarf uh, can be challenging in the context of, of the Linux kernel, I think we can still work on that. We have um, solutions, you know, you know, that are fast and and really, really, um, how can I say that, uh, practical, you know, today. Just to give you an idea of what we're talking about when we say fast and faster. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so we have a testing uh, repository in in the Libabiga world. Okay, so basically in the in the Libabigail uh, Git repository, historically, we used to carry a lot of binaries for testing purposes, okay? Uh, we were quite big on, on, on testing because if you don't test it, it doesn't work. And if, even when you test it, but anyway. Uh, and so, <laughs> uh, the, the problem is that uh, the, that repository or the final tarball is quite big, you know, like really big, just because of those binaries that are in the test uh, subdirectory. So what we started doing is to export, you know, that uh, testing stuff. So we have our own uh, repository for dedicated to that. And what we did was to put a huge kernel in that, well, an, an enterprise kernel in there, in there um, on which we run uh, our tests. So using that thing, when you, okay, here things are not ordered um, necessarily alphabetically anymore, you will understand. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, go figure how they're ordered. Uh, so um, for the, with the CTF front end, um, using an enterprise kernel with 3,000 plus module, things on my, on this laptop, uh, framework laptop, you know, um, in the plane, uh, took 30 seconds, you know, and 1.5 uh, gigabyte of resident memory size. With a BTF front end, uh, it took one minute and something. And for Dwarf, I had to reach the hotel first because I didn't have uh, enough, you know, power. Anyway, so it took 35 minutes. Um, so this is what we're talking about, you know. So deduplication takes time, and again, uh, I think I'm still, I I'm still to blame for some some of the slowness. So, so um, we're working on that, but you know, see for yourself. It is 
It is probably redundant for me to say that although in th neither the BTF nor the CTF deduplicators take that long to deduplicate the kernel, but they do to a degree cheat because they can do some of the deduplication in parallel. Well, I don't think Libra Bagel does. Yeah. Um, I think if you add the time, time up, if you didn't parallelize everything, CTF would take about five minutes to deduplicate the whole kernel. Mm. So there's something there you could probably improve on the dwarf front. There are a lot of things we can, we can, we can work on. Also, uh, it's meant to mention that the CTF and BTF, I do not know exactly, but the CTF size of this whole kernel is order of magnitude lower than the dwarf information. So also, you know, you have order of magnitude less information to process in CTF uh, case than in dwarf case. Yeah, they're trying to be nice to me. Please, <laughs> three orders of magnitude. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. But no, but the, seriously, so the cool thing is that, um, you know, we have alternatives. And, and, and even though we're, you know, uh, we're using the same framework, um, you know, we can, if, if, if we just agree to use what is, uh, um, what I think is well tailored for a certain task, um, yeah, things can go pretty well. Yeah, please go ahead. But do I understand that correctly, that that big dwarf rich information processing, it could be done just once on a huge resourceful build system and then put into debugging for and everyone can use it like for that's free true. already deduplicated and compressed. Ex exactly. Yeah, that's, I totally agree, yes. Uh, th that will be something done by, for instance, DWZ but with lots of resources and never giving up. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, that's... But I think we can, we can do better than that. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in the context so, of, of a distro, uh, let's say a, a Red Hat-based distro, you choose Koji, like my employer as well. Uh, we could probably generate the ABI report as part of the debug info or as a separate extra artifact of the build, uh, the way we do debug info using, RP, uh, using those RPM build hooks and all of that, right? That would make some amount of sense, having those in the repository to be able to reason about in the context outside of just the build system, basically. Yeah, so uh, have you heard the comment? So, because today there is a, there is a project um, called ABIDB. It is pretty much what you're saying. Um, it, it's an experimental project. Um, um, and, uh, where? Uh, on, in on Sourceware. Ah, in Sourceware. Yeah, it's Frank uh, Eigler who started it, okay. uh, who is a colleague of mine. Um, and yeah, he did, there is a talk about that on the, the FOSDEM website, you know, this, the FOSDEM of this year. Yeah. So if you look at uh, look for ABIDB. Oh, please. Yeah. Just to note that my medium-term goal, at least for C, and eventually in the distant, f distant fuzzy future for C++ and things as well, is to emit CTF deb uh, type info for every binary and keep it linked into the binary in the .ctf section. Um, it's very, it it's small. sufficiently small that yeah. you can just leave it, leave it in there. I just need to convince probably EU strip and or RPM debug info not to strip it out into the debug info section because it doesn't belong there, it belongs in the binary. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so just to come back to uh, the command here about um, having uh, build system artif okay, artifact built at the build time that are still that will be still there for other tools to you know take advantage of. So the ABIDB stuff, the ABIDB project, and I think there is even an article about that that he wrote. Uh, the idea is to so to take all the binaries on a on a on a system, okay, um, store their ABI representation. Okay, and then afterwards, if you want to see, to to know if another a, a binary that you have you know at hand is compatible with this with the ABI of the system you saved, then you just ask ABIDB is that binary compatible? You know, boom. So you don't have to have the the distro you know uh, locally to be able to you know to to ask that question. Does that make sense? And the thing that is he's using for storage is Git. The thing he's using as an RPC method 
is Git. The th you know, so it's everything is stored in Git, and uh, yeah, and it uses ABI Compat, you know, the tool. So, yeah, so what you say makes sense. Uh, and and what about what here, Doji? What about um, what about the binary representation of this? I, I never understood why LibAbigail uses XML or even textual representation. It was just for me for debugging. And then so yeah, but then users. all right. But then now, when you consider the possibility, for example, of, for example, embedding the corpuses, or you know, in, in sections in files, right? Just an example. Mm -hmm. Then this textual-based representation, which why is it text-based? Uh, there must be a reason for that. No, the the reason was just was just that I needed something to know if the IR I was emitting was garbage or not. But anyway. Ah, okay. So yeah. you could just read it directly. Uh, yeah. yeah. And, but uh, have you but considered that, adding a binary format for it, like emitting it I, in, like not, in, in BSON or? Yeah. Uh, person, I'm not okay. What separates me from doing that? It's uh, time. <laughs> Space, money, or whatever. Yeah. So, uh, it's just I don't have any. Okay, but I'm mentioning this because before you realize it, somebody is gonna start like embedding JSON or some other crap in in sections, like it has happened already with uh, with uh, freedom with RPMs metadata, you know, and stuff. Well, yeah, freedom. But then <laughs> we have to face the consequences. Freedom again. Okay, fine. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate it, Doji. Thank uh, you. Thank you. Responsibility. No, but yeah. <laughs> So no 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 I, I I totally agree um and and but at the same time I mean like if 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 we if we push that reasoning even further if we have um you know the type information we're talking about is compact enough uh, yeah you don't even have to save um, any binary representation of the ABI I mean you just use that thing and and that's it so Okay, and related question, sorry, I'm not. Is the type information always enough, or you have seen that you will benefit from some other kind of annotations or something so, to, to very make interesting. The so, there are, there are users, so we are very, okay, I, uh, try to be uh, uh, user directed. So, but yeah, because usually when I think about a feature and I think that it can be interesting, I'm always wrong. So, um, I. I tend to wait for users to come and ask for stuff. And so some users want, w would want to uh, detect some things, uh, some ABI changes that are not related to types, that are related, for instance, to, you know, calling conventions, you know, that might, not, that might be or might not be uh, compatible, you know, like things like that. And so if you want to support that, so you're way ahead of the league of types. So you would need to handle basically instructions, you know, even if it is push pop, uh, you know. Uh, and then for that, you, I would need things that are not in the realm of dwarf. You know, I will need to go look at instructions directly. Maybe have an IR uh, for for that. You know, this kind of stuff. But other than that. Oh, and today the other the other thing that we've been uh, using uh, aside of dwarf is um, the information from users of where header files are. Does that make sense? Because when you're looking at the binary, there is no such thing as a private or public type, or uh, exp you know everything. You see everything. And then you report uh, changes about some stuff, okay, some type, and the user will come and say, "Oh, this type is a private type. It was not present in the uh, slash you know slash usr slash include slash something." And so what we did is that okay, we said okay, so uh, ABI diff is going to have an option which is dash dash header file or dash dash header dir or dash dash header files and then you give me the header file. But then I don't go and parse the header file. What we do is we just look at the source location of the type, does that make sense? So I'm seeing a type. I see that the source location is uh, in btf.h. 
if btf the, if, if the file btf.h is present in the set of header files given by the user then we know that that type is defined in btf uh, you know in a is defined in the set of public uh, publicly exported types does that, does that make sense so these are the stuff that we've been needed uh, for, from uh, users as input have you considered the <clears throat> the option to match the types uh, names against uh, something because some ABIs define that, so you know if something is internal or not. Yeah. Depending on yeah. the name. Yeah. So for instance, uh, you have you have uh, some project that even use symbol versioning, elf symbol versioning, and. And so this, the, the name of the, the, the symbol version will mean something, meaning that this thing is internal, right? And so for those who know Valgrind, uh, Valgrind has something called suppression files, where you go and write, you tell Valgrind, okay, this is a problem, but please don't tell me about it. Oh, yeah. And so we have that in Libabigail as well. So we have suppression specifications, we call that. And so you can go there and say, okay, this type or this, um, ABI artifact, don't report about change, you know, changes about it. And you have a lot of conditions in there that you can express. Does that answer your question? But what about the opposite? Like, what like listing? What? What listing? Oh, yeah, yeah. We, you, can, you can also have that in the expression. Uh, so you, yeah, so the way you write the expression, you can put not in there, you can negate stuff. So it, yeah. It's kind of a, an interesting project in its own, yeah? Because you're probably worried, worried about, about KBI whitelists with their supporters. Yeah. So in terms of the KBI whitelist, for instance, I don't know if this is what you were talking about. Not specifically. But, yeah. So what we do is we suppress everything but that. So, yeah. So, yeah, it's taken into account. Anything else? Um. We have five minutes. Oh, super short. Maybe a short question. I hope it's fairly short. Um, so we were talking about limiting the uh, limiting the ABI to the published header, uh, the published symbols. Um, I really need to be able to generate an ABI only from those published headers and not from the source code at all. So I don't want to I don't want to involve the source code at all. I want to evaluate the ABI of the library strictly based upon the header files that I'm going to publish with the library mm -hmm. because the header files in theory, completely describe the ABI. Is there any way I can get the compiler to generate a library that contains all of those, all those ABI bits, all the debug information, enough to be able to generate an ABI without having the source code to the library? Well, to, okay, just to make sure we are on the same page. Today, we don't need the, the source code. But you need the library. I just need the binary. I, I don't have that. I want to generate. Actually, I want to generate an import library just from the header file. Ah, yes, of course. So, the, yeah, today that will be easy-ish. I mean, if the compiler can can, you know, uh, generate the information in a form we can that we can. Oh, if, if, so I, so I have to figure out how to make the compiler generate the d dwarf information from the header files without referencing. It, it can symbols. be dwarf, or, but it or, can. ABI XML, whatever. Right, whatever. You know, if we can, yeah, of course we can do that. Yeah, okay. I actually do that in some test, you know, in the regression, in some regression testing. So you just have a header file and suck yeah, it in. Yeah, exactly. Oh, I have stubs and I generate and you know, you uh, artificial artificial ABI for everything. that. Sorry. You have one C file including all the headers. I don't even have headers. <laughs> I just uh, dump. I, I generate the uh, an AR directly from, from a textual description. Like I say, it's a function. It has a return type that is an int. Yeah, I just, I just want to be able to use the header file directly without having but to yeah, but We could yeah, do yeah, that, yeah. yes, yes. I'll have to figure out how to make the compiler do that. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. We have too many time, we have too much time. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> One, one okay, too many questions then. Okay. One interesting way to do that would be to make the compiler emit uh, basically an empty file just with the symbols. And that would be enough to verify the ABI. Yeah. 
Yeah. So yeah, that that will work too. Even better because we could, yeah, just we, we don't have any we wouldn't have anything to to do to consume it. Yeah. So yeah, so if. If there is no more question, I, I, I wanted to, 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 well, to ask you a question. So, um, do you guys here think about some use cases apart of, outside of you know, uh, the build system? Because today, uh, the place where this um, ABI analysis stuff um, is used the most, in my opinion, from what I know, is in the build system. So do folks here have other uh, use cases uh, in mind that will be different from build systems, yeah. Yeah, I even have questions in case there's no questions. I don't know, but for safety critical applications, for the highest level of criticality in like aerospace, you have to do object mapping to source code mm -hmm. and show how the changes trickle through. So like I said, I don't know, but it sounds like you're getting close to that. Okay, interesting. And, and also show where the change occurred too. So between two different builds, you can show how the progression occurred and assess the impact. So there is definitely an application there, it sounds like. Okay, come and talk to us then if it is. So thank you very much for uh, your attention and your participation and uh, um, I wish you a great uh, conference. <laughs>